worshiped and glorified is our Savior. Joyful in this moment. Are we being perfected? Are we learning to be worshipers in spirit and truth? Are we fulfilling the requirements of God? Being guided by the Holy Spirit and this great blessing that this glorious Lord has granted us. Receiving our sister Maria Luisa here in Pachuca. We've been waiting for you with an open heart. May God bless you always. Amen. Good afternoon. May God bless you. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your affection. And those brothers and sisters here of Pachuca. I come to see you. I came to visit and to bring the spiritual nourishment Amen. and welcome those that are visiting. A special greeting for all of you. Amen. And today it is a teaching, today of a day of testimonies. The Bible study will be briefer, but we are going to concentrate now in the teaching and then later with your questions those that you are going to do beautiful the bible studies the lord has been manifesting the lord has been revealing the doctrine he has been doing miracles for the people many persons have been testifying of the miracles that they have received on behalf of the lord healings solution to problems protecting from dangers from wrongs fulfilling the petitions of the heart solutions to problems in the household and the family the lord is doing everything in the church so what is important is that you believe in god trust in the lord we have to trust in god when the lord makes a promise that he's going to bless or that he's going to, or that he makes a promise he's going to give a solution to a problem we have to believe and trust we have to trust and we have to read the bible i invite you to read the bible because reading the Bible is how you're going to leave your doubts and your worries. Because in truth, the religion has been so given so much depth of knowledge that enclosed us and has blinded us. And this is why it invites us to read the Bible for the Lord to reveal and you will see how the Lord will enter to move the hearts. The Lord will teach and the Lord as well will give you that joy and that happiness because the Lord makes man joyful. In Psalm number 15, let us meditate upon the Lord and then a time for questions. Today, the service shall be different because of the Bible study. There's not going to be a preaching, simply a teaching, and as well a time for your questions. Here in Psalm 15, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? First, I would like to explain to you the word Lord. Lord is a word in Hebrew, and it did not have the E or the O, the word Jehovah. It simply had the vowels, the three word, three letters. And this is how the Lord showed to David in the ancient times. He told him that his name, we say Jehovah, to be able to pronounce it. Because if we did not have these vowels, we would not be able to pronounce it. And it would be very difficult. So they added these letters but it means Lord. The word Jehovah means the Lord of battles, the Lord of war. Because in the ancient times, the Lord to Moses sent to battle against the nations to conquer the kingdoms, to have possession of lands. So the Lord told Moses to battle against all those persons and you will own all that you see, the land of Canaan. And this is why the Lord said, I will be with you and I will make that you win these battles. You will overcome. 
So the Lord always in the ancient times and the people of Israel were in these battles with all of these neighboring nations of Israel. The Lord was with them and they won all of these battles. We do not know why the Lord wanted it for it to be in this manner. Perhaps because of the sin, the sin of the people. The Lord was so angry with man and this is why he separated them, aparted from them, left them, and chose the people of Israel. And this is why the Lord gave the victory to the people of Israel in these battles. And the word Jehovah means Lord of battles. Because he was the one that was there battling for his people. And they would have triumph in victories. So this, the word Jehovah, or those who are here for the first time or are new, they say, I had never heard that word. It is Lord. And we know that we say Lord in, in the languages that, it, that we learned. It is easier to pronounce. We know that we came from this primitive languages. We say, I maybe have never heard the word Jehovah, creator, all-powerful, or he that made the heavens. We understand that from these, but from Greek or in Hebrew, we see this word. I remember many times, brothers and sisters, that when they came for the first time and they read the word in the Bible and they were fearful and they didn't understand, they said, what is this? They never saw that word before. But now I explain it to you so you can be clear and not be fearful of seeing this word. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? I'm going to remind you the story in Jerusalem. The Lord ordered, ordered Solomon. You know the story of King Solomon. The Lord ordered King Solomon to build a temple for him, the Lord in Jerusalem. And David built a city, a palace. It was called the palace of the king. The holy mountain or the city of David or the city of Jerusalem or Zion. Those were the names that this palace had that King David built. And in this palace, Solomon built the temple for our Lord. In this temple, sacrifices were made, and the priests were continuously making sacrifices for the Lord and praying for the people. So here the question. They ask the Lord a question, and they say to our Lord, Who would dwell in this tabernacle? Or who would be living or abiding in this temple or in this holy hill of the Lord? Whom? Whom deserved to be there? Because this temple during that time that was physical was representing for the future the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord, the Bible says, is the heart of man. When the Lord enters to dwell and live in the heart of a man or a woman that does the will of the Lord, logically that does not sin. So it says this man, this woman convert into the temple of the Lord. And as well, the Bible says that the gathering of all the persons that look for God is called church and that the Lord is there in the midst of his church in the midst of his people that look for him. This is why the question that is asked to our Lord, whom will abide in your tabernacle? Or who may dwell in your holy hill? And the Lord gives this answer. He responds in verse 2. Please read. So the Lord says, that is he who walks uprightly. I think that you understand what it is to walk uprightly. It is to not practice sin. And we know what are the sins. There are sins that are visible, like adultery, fornication, murder, kidnapping, etc. And there are sins that are hidden, like envy ambition, grudge, hate, pride, arrogance. Those are hidden sins. But all of this is sin. And all of this 
when we know the Lord and we give ourselves and we decide to do the will of the Lord, he changes us. He helps us to change. And in our heart, all of this flows. So in our heart, there's no longer killing or murder or fornication or adultery, no violation, pride or arrogance or to hurt anyone or to envy anyone, but to love and be merciful. This is what begins to dwell in our heart. So to this we call uprightly. And as well, when we are responsible of our actions, responsible with our own self, with our family, in our household, with our neighbors, with our work, in our school, in our university, in our factory, in our office, when we are responsible and organized and honest and we are good employees or good employers and we're honest we pay the salary on time or they pay us on time and I work honestly to this we call we work righteous with righteousness so it's not the fact to say that I work in this company uh, in a bakery and I say I'm gonna steal a, a loaf because the owner is rich and he does not need that loaf maybe not maybe it's right to think this way but the Lord is watching and the Lord says you're not honest you're not being rightful you're not having a brightness you're failing because there is a spirit of thief of stealing that bread it's the same as stealing a horse or a cow or stealing a TV or something that you might want. It's the same. The fact, the action is not the amount or what is the value. So therefore, that is called integrity in which we should have. We should be careful. And this is why the Lord has called us and has gathered us here. That we learn and that each day we become better and progress. And this way the Lord will be joyful with us and will have us in his holy place. And it says, which you already read in verse 2, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart, the truth in his heart, for the persons had the custom of speaking false doctrines. Here this truth is of false doctrines in disvering the path of the people and conducing them towards disvering ways. Let us go to the medium. Let us go to the wizards. Let us go to he that reads the tarot cards. Let us go to them. Let us go to that person. Oh, they call upon God. So they read the Bible, surely. And they tell you everything of your life. Let's go to them and see what they say. Let us see and do a spell on so-and-so. This is to disvere you to the wrong path when we should say let us read the bible let us see if reading the bible we find god and we have an encounter with him let us do what is right and best other persons no let us go to this saint or that saint and there there's this saint in that country or that person that does a miracle let us then ask for that man or that woman to do a miracle for us all of this is to deceive another and not speak the truth, the truth of God. The truth of the Lord is the Bible. The Bible is the only true book that speaks of the Lord. And this is the only truth that we should proclaim and publish. And the same, because if pe people thought that he that speaks the truth in his heart is that you lie to another, and say, oh, I don't want to talk to him. Tell him I'm not here. Oh, that's a lie. He's not saying the truth. No, that's simply justification. But it has nothing to do with truth. Or someone says, oh, let me borrow $500. I'm, we're going to negotiate and we're going to gain more money. And then if I gain $500, i am going to give you a lot more money. We're going to multiply it. But then he didn't really ever return that money. There he's deceiving him. Apparently, he didn't tell him the truth. He didn't tell him the whole story. He deceived him. But we don't need to confuse the truth that it speaks here in Psalms to being deceived. 
You deceive people. You trick them. You lie to them. You lie. But this truth that it speaks here and speaks the truth in his heart is a man or woman that is proclaiming the path righteous that goes to eternal life and is speaking to the people the truth and is correcting and is teaching and not in any moment is willing to deceive or to subordinate or to threaten or to harm any other person. It is a person that is righteous in his heart. Very well. Verse 3. There is another requirement. What is the requirement? Please read. Because they know that there was a time where we read in the Bible, in the ancient times, there were persons who would slander. They would pay for false witnesses. And because of this slander, they would take a person... Being innocent, they would be put in prison. They would take them to death, to the death penalty. Being innocent, because the person was envious, they would pay for false witness, or they would slander. And they would say, yes, oh, I saw him stealing, oh, I saw him doing this or that. And they would pay for the false witness, and they would take them to death or to prison. So this is why it says that he who does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil. The Lord Jesus was spoken slander of and they paid false witness. And they accused him and this is why he was condemned to death. Anyone who does these things cannot be in the tabernacle nor dwell in, with the Lord. There is another requirement. Who will be in your tabernacle? Who will dwell in your holy hill? Read verse 4. It reads in verse 5. Another requirement. He who does not put out his money at usury. Do you understand out of his money at usury? High interest rates. At high interest rates. And the people, those that li would like to charge excessively, who are overly ambitious, they dedicate to these high interest rates. That they borrow, that they charge at an extra 10%. And the person cannot pay that extra high interest rate so what does he do he takes away the property he takes away the car or the vehicle or whatever it was that they negotiated with he takes it away from him and the person is in ruin that is a sin before the lord a sin before the lord that a person having money to borrow and charge at an excessive high interest rate that is called usury who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent that he would accuse and harm against another, he that is innocent. And it says, He who does these things shall never be moved. He that lives in integrity. He that lives doing what is correct. Living, respecting, and valuing the other persons and respecting things how they should be valuing persons as they are in trying to help others extending their hand living the life that goes to eternity trying to comfort a person speaking to them of God asking the Lord for he that suffers or is sick all of this he that does these things he that does these things shall never be moved. Never will he make a mistake. Never will he desvere his path. Never will he perish. Will he be destroyed? Because the Lord will always will take him by the hand 
until the end and will bless him throughout his life and will help him until the end for he will have eternal life and we have to always read these psalms this psalm is very important that we read and learn learn to live a righteous life a good life before the Lord and cast away our ambitions and our selfishness and give to others give to others sincerely love and as well to help them with material things this is what the Lord says and this is what we want to be so that we can dwell with God and that it may be fulfilled this such beautiful verse that says the Lord who will dwell in your tabernacle and who may abide in your holy hill he who walks uprightly and works righteousness who speaks the truth this truth of God and follows the path of truth he will have triumph he will have victory and we thank our Lord for the scripture of his word we thank the Lord for being with us for supporting us so glory be the name of our Lord and to you to learn to give the glory to our God not to say just amen but glory be to the Lord glory be to the Lord but with all of your heart and with all of our soul say glory be to the Lord because you think of God that it not be something mechanical that you simply say glory to the Lord and you're thinking of it at home you're gonna leave at three o'clock where am I gonna go to lunch no you say glory to the Lord because God is here with us amen so as well one of these days become in the habit of saying glory to the Lord don't be shameful or be embarrassed to say glory to the Lord we would barely now say amen now how can we say glory to the Lord glory to the Lord amen. glory to the Lord questions questions Good afternoon, Sister Maria Luisa. May the Lord bless you. Welcome to Pachuca. And today, Pachuca are exalted first because the Lord looked upon Pachuca, the presence of the Lord and all his beloved servant. I have a question, my beloved sister. In the book of John 4, we're going to be participating in the scripture John John chapter 4 the gospel of John chapter 4 verse 23 in two verses 23 and 24 yes brother if you please allow me allow me to read yes sir but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Very well. I was searching for the answer, my beloved sister, in many places. I was singing and worshiping the Lord. And the order didn't seem right to me because there was disorder but I found this beautiful verse you mean in the other places that you gathered you mean they told you that you had to do something yes yes they would tell me you're only gonna do this and that why am I only gonna do this I want to teach the word I want to speak to the people I want to teach to love God but it was not this congregation it was other congregations and other movements but I would like for you to teach us my sister what it is to worship the Father in spirit and truth how beautiful this scripture that the brother is asking of it is speaking that the Lord Jesus Christ f crossed with a Samaritan woman she was taking water this Samaritan was a woman who was belittled let us say by the Jews there in Jerusalem 
And the Lord began to have a dialogue with her, a conversation. And the Lord asked her of the water that she was taking from the well. And the Lord said, I want water. And she said, but I can't take it because it's too deep, the well. And there the Lord begins to speak with her of God. She did not know whom she was speaking with. And the Lord speaks to her and says, if you knew whom asks you to drink. And says as well, he that drinks of the water I give will never be thirsty. But he that drinks of this well will have thirst. So the woman was curious and began to say, who are you? Speak to me of you. Who are you, Lord? Are you a prophet? And the Lord says to the Samaritan woman, you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not a husband. And says, you're a prophet. You are a prophet. And they, during that time, were waiting for the Lord to send prophets to the people. During that time, no one was thinking of curses or spells or spiritists. Because another can say, oh, you're a medium. Oh, you're a medium. Yes, you're a medium. No. During that time, this was not the custom in those places. The people knew that the Lord would send a prophet. Prophets were sent to speak to the people. So the woman said, I think you're a prophet because you have told me the truth. So then after so much dialogue and the Lord evangelizing to her that she is to go to eternal life, believing in him, trusting in him, the woman was changing because she began to do a miracle in her heart and transform her. And for this, in verse 21, please read. What did the Lord say to her? So the woman, the Samaritan woman says to the Lord Jesus, Lord, tell me, where is it that we have to adore God? Here in Jerusalem or there in Samaria? There in Samaria, they told us that we have to worship God. And the Jews, you say that is here in Jerusalem. Where is it, Lord? So the Lord tells her, the hour is coming and neither here nor there. We will worship the Lord. But the Lord says, you worship what you do not know. And we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the time comes. And the time is now. The time will come. And now is the time when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. We today are worshiping our Lord in spirit because in spirit, for where is the statue? There is no painting. We do not see here a statue or a painting that say it is God. We are not seeing any monument, nothing in that aspect to say it is God. We simply close our eyes to concentrate and we worship the Lord in spirit because the Lord is spirit and he is here in spirit. And the Lord Jesus said, it is the time, the hour has come in the moment when the Lord preached the gospel. The Lord was in spirit in all places. And why? Because in the ancient times and the people of Israel and the temple, the Lord had said in the back portion to in the highest, holiest place where is the ark and where would be the ark of the covenant and the priest once a year would enter would speak with God and the Lord would manifest because the Lord would descend and speak with the high priest and then the high priest would leave and tell the people and would bless them and forgive their sins the high priest would that was the custom in the time of the people of Israel but the Lord, when he tells the Samaritan woman, but the hour is no longer in Jerusalem, nor in Samaria, where you will worship God, because the Lord is spirit. And from now on, the Lord you will adore in spirit and truth. 
It is no longer that the priest will enter into the holiest place once a year to speak. And it's no longer will you be far from God because God will be with you. That was the marvelous promise. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord with us. God in spirit with us, speaking with us, teaching, governing. So here the Lord says that such worshipers the Lord looks for. 24. Read 24. So when I say that I worship him in spirit, is because I kneel down or I seated or I'm laying down. I close my eyes. I raise my hands, possibly, and I ask the Lord and I thank him. I praise him for my house, for my life, for my what I'm eating, for what I'm doing. And then I share with him my needs. I tell him what I'm doing. I tell him that I need the spiritual things and how he manifests in my life. Because there you are in spirit telling the Lord, asking the Lord, because I'm not before a, a painting or a monument or I'm not praying to this saint or that saint. But it is a Lord in spirit that is there. So therefore, I in spirit am looking for him, worshiping him, glorifying him. I close my eyes to not be distracted with others. I close my eyes because if I pray with my eyes open, I'm looking around and I'm distracted with the bars, with the walls, with the columns. I won't concentrate on what I'm saying. So I close my eyes so that way I won't be distracted and I can concentrate better in worshiping the Lord and imagine so many things that the Lord has done for me, for me, for the people, for the power that he has descended. That is to worship the Lord in spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes to us, and makes us speaks in tongues and gives us gifts, the gift of prophecy, many gifts that are in the church, there as well as the Holy Spirit, the Lord working with us in spirit. And when we worship the Lord and we speak in tongues, we praise him in spirit. When we sing to the Lord, we are in the flesh sharing to the Lord, worshiping the Lord in spirit. Let there not be anything in front of me telling me this is a God, that this is a Lord, that we have to adore him there because this is this monument, it's a statue, a painting. It is not that. That is not to look for God or worshiping God in spirit. That is called idolatry. So the Lord clearly says the Lord is spirit and those that worship him in spirit and truth, it is necessary to adore so this is when the woman says, oh, Lord, but I heard that the Savior, the Messiah is coming, the Christ. And he will, when he comes, he would tell us all things. And the Lord said, I who speak to you am he. Blessed is the Lord. Glorious is the Lord. Glory be to the Lord. It is this. May the honor be for him. This is beautiful to glorify the Lord. Another question. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, Sister Maria Luisa, with respect and joy, I am before you, a promise of the Lord, to be here before his servant. My question is of the Bible. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. My question is, why the Lord chose the tenth day and better yet, ordered why they took the lamb. What did it mean? The 10th of this month. Well, more or less on my Jewish calendar is March, April. Between March and April is the first month of the year. Yes. So the Lord here was giving like the calendar. So this is why. The 10th of this month, each one take a lamb. It was to celebrate the Passover. 
So they taught the people of Israel that each year to sacrifice a lamb, to prepare it and to eat, and they said have a great feast. And this lamb was a symbolism or the prototype of Jesus Christ as a lamb that went on the Calvary and taught the Jews that they make a feast. But this feast is not like the feast that people do today. The feast that people do today is of dancing and of partying and drinking. No, it is for something different. The feast here it is to adore God, simply worshiping the Lord, praising, glorifying, worshiping the Lord all day in the tabernacle. And they say each one would sacrifice their lamb. They would cook and they would eat. And the family were few they had would give to their neighbors. But nothing could be left over for the next day. Everything would have to be consumed that same day, glorifying the Lord. They would sing to the Lord with musicians, instruments. They would play for the Lord, all for his glory. So there is no envy of those feasts today. These were feasts that were spiritual, what they would do, and the Lord required from them. Even though some were so abusive because they would drink excessively, they would drink too much until the moment they were drunk and the Lord would become angry. He always became angry with the people because they never did things for God correctly. But they did so for their own self, for their own pleasing. Let us continue. Another question. Sister Maria Luisa, good afternoon. It is a joy to have you here. A blessing for the brothers and sisters of Pachuca. Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. Sister, welcome. There it is. Amen. It's correct. Sister, I have two verses in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, verse 43. Verse 43 through 45, sister. Yes. Here, if you could please explain a little more profoundly. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. 44. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Well, the wicked generation that it speaks, so shall that last sentence, so shall it also be with this wicked generation. You read this, correct? What does that mean? What wicked generation is the Lord referring to? Of the Jews. The Lord was referring to the Jews because he was preaching the gospel to the Jews. But let us not say the common people, but the leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, the leaders of the people. They did not believe in Christ. They did not believe in the Lord. And they were speaking slander of our Lord in all moments. So the Lord gave this illustration and he said to you, you are a wicked generation because I am preaching the truth of God. I am preaching the gospel and you don't believe to you are belittling. You cast me out. You tell me I'm demon possessed and lying. All of this, the Lord said to them, all of this and said you are a wicked generation the lord chose you as the chosen ones the people of israel to waste time because now you are a wicked generation the lord says so the lord gives this illustration this same will occur will occur as when a wicked spirit enters a man or a woman and this spirit suffers 
because they are tormented and looks for a place of rest. And since they don't find rest, that spirit returns to where it left, that person of which it left, and sees that this person continues in sin because that heart, instead of being with God, is empty and full of sin. So the demon says, looking for others, and says, let us dwell with this man. And these other spirits enter and dwell until he becomes schizophrenic, until he's crazy, like we say. And that state is worse than the first. And this is what the Lord says would occur to that wicked generation. Those Jews, those Pharisees that were rejecting the Lord, this will occur. Why? Because the Lord says to these Pharisees, these Jews, you previously were without God. The Lord had not sent prophets. The Lord did not manifest to you. For 430 years, the Lord abandoned you. And you were there living with the devil. You were enslaved by the devil. The devil had you slaves. But now that I come to speak of the gospel so that you are sanctified, purified, you can be happy so you can have salvation, you reject me. So as you have rejected me, what occurs? Worse things will now occur because the Father is going to punish you harshly, will cast you from his presence, and you are going to be without God, and one day you will be condemned eternally. This is what will happen. This is the illustration that the Lord gave to these Pharisees, to these people, unbelieving, and compared it to this wicked spirit. And this unclean spirit is true, something certain that today is well the Lord delivers the persons of unclean spirits, but the Lord wants for that person to look for God. That person that does not look for the Lord, other spirits come and possess him. The Jews of whom he was preaching that were going to lose the blessing, lose the blessing, the people of God, the people of the Lord is the blessing formed of people of many nations, that of Jesus Christ. Hopefully I have been clear and have not confused you more of, with this explanation, but this explanation is the illustration to evangelize the people during that time. But remember that when you read this of the generations, this generation perverse says, I'm not going to give you signs. The Lord said generations, not people of Israel, not Jews, but generation cursed, wicked. The Lord said to them, John said the same, referring to the Jews, unbelieving. Let us continue. Good afternoon, Sister Maria Luisa. Welcome to the Church of Pachuca with all of those that are with you. My heart overflows with joy, and it is a promise of the Lord. My question is in first of Psalms. First of Samuel, first of Samuel, chapter 14. Verse 27 and 29. First of Samuel 14, verse 27. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Therefore he stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his countenance brightened. 29. But Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of his honey. My questions are, what does it refer to that his eyes were brightened? How, was he, how did he realize, and if this can happen to us? 1 Samuel, are we on the reading, chapter 14? 1 Samuel 14. History, this is history. This is true. This was physical. All this was real. All this occurred in the history 
of Jonathan, the son of King Saul. Here then, here they were in battle, making a sacrifice, prohibited all the persons to not eat anything. They had to be in fasting. And they fasted, and they did not have the strength to confront the enemy, and they were defeated. But Jonathan, the son of the king, Saul, he did not hear the order of his father, that he had said for no one to eat anything or drink anything. He did not hear it. So this is why when he arrives and see everyone is fainted from hunger or thirst, he found a honeycomb and said, well, let us eat honey. And he ate the honey because they, didn't, they couldn't even see from how hungry they were. You, there are persons who, when they're so hungry, they can't even see from their blood count, their blood cells. They can't even see because of their hunger. There are persons who cannot sustain not eating for a long period of time. But now I can see, now I have energy. He was blind and now he sees better. My eyes are brightened because it gave him energy, the honey. So Jonathan criticized the attitude of his father. How is it that my father is going to prohibit them from eating? Look at how they are. And I taste the honey and I'm fine. This is what Jonathan did. That he thought he had done fine. Saul was angry with his son for having disobeyed. Even greater reason. The Lord was not in agreement with all of these actions. And according to history, they were all punished. He punishes Saul. But here then the sister said, what is this of his eyes were brightened physically? Because since he hadn't eaten his body and physically he wasn't seen correctly. This was simply history. And Saul wanted the people to fast for the Lord to help them. And those are simply things that occurred. It's not anything so significant for us in our spiritual life. Is not something that we need to reiterate. What would we reiterate for us today? Perhaps it's not anyone at fault. Saul gives an order. Jonathan was not there. And Jonathan didn't know what the order was. Perhaps maybe there was not wisdom from Jonathan on his behalf. Why are they all so weak? What happened? Someone would have said, Oh, your father, the king, gave an order for no one to eat. That's what Jonathan should have asked. Maybe he should have had wisdom to inquire. He simply acted. Maybe today, when there is a misunderstanding, because there are many misunderstandings, when there's a misunderstanding, it's better to ask before acting to not make a mistake. Another question? Good afternoon. May God bless you. Sister Maria Luisa, welcome to Pachuca. I love you in the Lord. It's a promise of the Lord that would be speaking to you with respect and joy. Sister, I have two questions of the Bible, if you please allow. The first, Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And ye shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second scripture, Deuteronomy 10.21. 10.21. He is your praise and he is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. My question, sister, how is that we should show our love to please the Lord through the worship and praise. Well, in the worship, that it flow from the heart, but as well our acts should show, our acts in our life, in our daily life. There, when during the day, where? When you're at home, when you're in your household, when you're at work, in your study, in your business, wherever you might be, where are you? How is your life? How the Lord looks at you. How the Lord is observing you. This. 
there in those places you are pleasing God, loving God. Why? Because you are not sinning. You do your routine, your work, your studies, or wherever you might need to be. And you are always meditating and asking upon the Lord to change, to help you to be a good man or woman, correct, holy, and perfect. And then later, when you have time to come in the evenings to worship the Lord and glorify the Lord, well, logically, the Lord is going to be very joyful. The worship for during the day you procured and made the effort to please him in all that you did, in your work, and in the material things. Because in your heart there was no hate or envy or rage, none of these things against anyone. And you always are looking to understand and comprehend the path of God. So the Lord is pleased. So when you come to the worship and you tell him beautiful things, he receives them and he's joyful. And the Lord is going to say, they want to change. I'm going to help him or her because they want to please me. They worry to please me. This is what is called when the Lord says here to Moses to teach the people to worship God with all of the heart, with all of the soul, the heart and soul. We all have to do so with all of your heart and soul to worship the Lord, praise the Lord, glorify the Lord. It is this, to abandon the sin and to worry of pleasing the Lord in all. That is to adore him with all of your heart and soul. Another question, the second question, Deuteronomy 7.26, and it reads, Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. The second is, but... But here in verse 26, it is the answer to 25. You shall burn the carved images of their gods. For when they went to battle, the kings would give to the hand of Israel. You are not going to take their gods, their sculptures of their gods. You will burn them in the fire. Do not covet the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it. You have to burn it all, destroy it. Do not bring any abomination to your house so that you will not be doomed. You will utterly detest it and abhor it for it is a cursed thing. So the Lord prohibited them to take anything from these battles, from these neighboring nations, for they were all idolaters to not take the gold or the silver that was on these gods because it was a sin before the Lord that the Israelites would take anything when they were all, these persons were dead, that they would take anything from them. For their own ambition, they would take the things and they didn't honor the Lord or obey him. And they did take, the Bible mentions that they did take those riches and they would take it. And they did do in, against the will of God for the Lord prohibited it. This is why the Lord became angry with the people of Israel, because they were disobedient with God. Now the next question. The same. Deuteronomy 13, 17. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy, have compassion on you and multiply you, just as he swore to your fathers. So my question is, how can we understand today this of the accursed things? Well, easy, that we not participate of pagan feasts because they're all pagan feasts and that we not participate in the saints or this holy day or that holy day. For example, there are, each country has religious holidays and that we not participate in these activities. And for example, here in Mexico, you celebrate the Day of the Dead, for example, of this day. You celebrate that day. They, we as believers, do not participate that day. It is a sin before the Lord. The Lord punishes us 
the Lord punishes us. However it might be, he will punish us for participating. So we do not need to do that. Oh, that bread, they baked it because it was on that day. No, the people say that is for the dead. That is a superstition. They bake that bread for that dead. Well, I won't eat that bread. I'm not going to die for not eating the bread that day. And I please the Lord. I don't know what other feast or holidays, for example, that they do on certain day. And they have, oh, there's a doll that you purchase on that day. Certain holidays that you celebrate in December. If we start to participate in all of these holidays, we are offending God. We are sinning because we are doing what pagans do. Participating in the pagan holidays. We are not adoring God in spirit and truth. Why are we going to mix with the beliefs, superstitions, and customs of the people in doing what they do? Dress in yellow or dress in red or you need to dress in purple. You need to eat this and that in a certain day and a certain time. You need to eat at midnight. You need to eat on this day or eat this bread or it has to be on a certain date. There's certain days that is December 8, or it has to be July 4, or it has to be November 1st. Each country has different dates and holidays where they are celebrating paganism. And people take these holidays just as superstitions. When we are knowledgeable of God, we should no longer be interested or even be moved by these holidays. We are not going to die of hunger for not eating those certain foods. If you want to eat and drink another day, that's fine. But do not follow traditions or customs on that day. Because that is bad. The Lord does not part want us to participate. I want the Lord to use me. I want the Lord to use me in perfection. I want to be a preacher, an evangelist. And when these holidays come, there you are participating and enjoying these same foods. No. Is the Lord pleased with you then? No. The Lord is zealous. And the Lord will punish us. And we don't realize it. But yes, when the wicked days come, when the difficulties and the problems are there, the illnesses, an accident occurred, the poverty, the, all these situations, then we realize that the Lord did punish us. So brothers and sisters, let us be wise. Yes, it's beautiful that you read the Bible and ask the Lord that you not be defiled. So you have your family. Oh, my family criticizes me and is forcing me. Oh, they're going to cast me out. They're going to, I'm going to lose my inheritance. They're going to not say hello to me. They're not going to invite me. Are we going to live from our family or is my family paying my rent for me? Is my family paying the groceries? What's the hurry? Why am I worried? But I am not going to go and be with my family and displeasing God. So better yet, I will avoid the situation. I'll make up a trip. I'll make up some other plan that day. And that way the Lord is not angry. We will come up with strategies. Those that are strong and have their own conviction. Those that are weak because there are those that are weaker, more sensitive. They're scared of everything or worried about everything. Make up a trip. Find a strategy and say, Lord, help me. Help me because I want, don't want to offend you, Lord. I don't want to be fanatical, Lord. And I don't want to offend my family. Lord, help me. Help me. So the Lord will go and help you. The Lord will help you and teach you, counsel you. The Lord will give you a dream and will speak to you and tell you what you can do wisely. And you will see that this way you will not have any problems or be involved. And you will always please the Lord. Pleasing our Lord. Very well. Let us continue. The Church of Pachuca is joyful to have you here visiting us. It's a great blessing to have you promise of the Lord that I would be asking a question my question Romans 2 verse 21 you therefore who teach another do you not teach yourself 
You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Sister Maria Luisa, I would like those that lead the people of Israel were blinded spiritually to not realize that what they taught and required were not putting into practice. And if today, those of us that serve the Lord in the spiritual as a testimony for other believers, can we as well be blind spiritually to not realize that with our actions, we're not applying the doctrine that we preach? Well, here it is speaking the Apostle Paul of the Jews and the law of Moses. In the law of Moses is the teaching that you should not steal, do not commit adultery, do not dishonor God, the law of Moses. And the followers of the law of Moses would begin to preach for example, the Pharisees, they were preachers of the law of Moses on Saturday. And they would preach to the people. And when they saw if a person was committing a sin, a fault, for example, someone who was stealing, there immediately they would take them, put them in prison, would stone them or whip them. They would place the punishment fiercely. But they, those that would govern the Pharisees, those that taught the law, they lived committing sins. They lived committing these sins, but since no one judged them, because who would look at them? Who would criticize them? But they did have the right to go and punish another. And what they did was hidden, and no one would tell them anything. This is why when the Lord Jesus, they took a woman to her and said, Lord, there we give you this woman. She was caught in adultery. And in the law of Moses, it says that she needs to be stoned. The Lord Jesus realized that those that brought the woman were as well persons who had committed other sins. And this is why the Lord said, well, okay, we have to fulfill the law of Moses. But he that does not have a sin, cast the first stone. He that does not have a sin, and the Lord knew they all had committed sin. So they all left and no one was there and she was left alone because they all had committed sin. This is what the Apostle Paul says here. The Apostle Paul says that the Jews believed they were instructors of the law of Moses. They thought they were professors of the word and that you who teach others, you do not teach yourself. You preach not to steal, and you steal. You say, that do not commit adultery, and you commit adultery. As it is written, the word of the Lord, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For the Gentiles saw that the Jews preached, but never fulfilled what they preached. And this is why they spoke blasphemy against the Lord. They say that God is a lie. The God of the Jews is a lie because they preach to not steal and there they are stealing. So the Gentiles, they would mock them and they would speak against the Lord. The sister asked, if this that occurred during that time can happen to us? Yes, it can. Why? Because we consider ourselves to be a church, that we are the church of the Lord, that we're Christians, we say. And if we are sinning, and if we commit sin in our home, with our families, neighbors, friends, at work, wherever we might be in our school, and there we are practicing sin, the people, what are they going to say? Oh, aren't you Christian? Oh, that you're Christian. Don't you go to a church where God speaks? This is what God speaks to steal. This is what God says to be rude. To, to be cursing, to be arrogant. This is what God teaches you in your church. Is that, that not what people would say to us? They would. So this is why we have to be careful. When you're going to say to a person that you're Christian, that you go to a church, that God speaks 
say I go to a church where God speaks and I feel peace and joy. God has changed me, but I still am not perfect. I still have faults, but I go to the church because little by little God is changing me. If you want to go, I invite you. But it's not that I'm going to say 100% I am perfect of Christianity because it is better for not be mocked or criticize the Lord because of our bad testimony. So we need to be careful. That is what is important. The final question. Thank you, sister. May God bless you. Sister, I have a question. If you could please explain Revelation 13, verse 15. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. If, if I can read, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause his, as many as should, would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Sister, I have seen articles and I have read, seen images. There have been scientific studies to implant chips in the people. And in the future, the way in which, the way in which you can purchase or sell. And persons who do not have the chip cannot do so. What relation does this modern have with these verses? No. I don't think, I don't think that this, what it says here, is something, it's very symbolical, abstract, and is something that the Lord is only going to know. I think that the only mark that we can have, that if we have a seal and a mark, invisible, our life, how is our life? You analyze your life and say, how is my life? Is it a life of sin? Am I committing sin? Am I doing wrong to the people? Am I in bad? Am I wicked? Am I grudgeful? No, I consider that I am a person who is aspiring to please God and do the will of the Lord. Of course, the mark or the seal that I have is of God. And he that is committing sin or being wicked or in sinning and sinning and sinning, surely he may have the mark, the mark of the beast which is invisible, no one knows it, simply the Lord and the devil as well, because the devil has power and knows things. So he, they're the only ones that can know who has the mark, who is condemned and who will win eternal life. It is this, the rest are physical and material things. It has nothing to do with our stability in this world, with our life, let us not worry about this. It is the Lord whom defines all. Who has the mark and the seal of the Holy Spirit or who has the mark of the devil? It is the Lord who knows and defines in the works and our actions. Tell us how we are and what we are and where we're going. Because our conscience teaches us if we're living correctly or wrongfully. So we know I'm living wrongfully. I need to be better before the Lord. So this, this chip that you speak of, those are physical and material things that have nothing to do with the Lord. Well, brothers and sisters, let us rise and pray to our Lord. And in this prayer, we're going to be asking of our Lord for the physical illnesses, mental, witchcraft, spirits, for paralysis, those that are in a wheelchair, for those that suffer Down syndrome, all the illnesses, diverse things, you're going to ask the Lord. If you have petitions before the Lord, remind the Lord your petition, your need, your, the want in your heart. Let us do this today before our Lord so that the Lord will bless. The Lord may bless us and hear us. Blessed Lord, all-powerful, holy Lord, thank you, Lord. We give you thanks in this day. 
In this moment, Lord, we thank you because we have been meditating upon your word, meditating upon the Bible. Lord, we will never tire of reading or meditating upon your word because always we are going to find new things, new things we shall find in your scripture. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you are giving us understanding to be able to understand and comprehend. But most beautiful, Lord, that you would help us to put into practice all that we learn, all that we understand, all that we read, O oh Lord, that we put it into action, that we put it as proof that we act, that we do your will that we not be stubborn, that we not be self-willed, Lord, or rebellious, or that we want to do our own way, but that we submit to you and do your will and please you in all, that we honor you, that we praise you, glorify your name, O Lord. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you, Holy Lord, for being with us, for listening to us, for looking upon us and for having mercy for us. Father, look at us. We are simply human beings, but you, Lord, have exalted us. You engrain us. You support us. You make us marvelous promises. Thank you, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And as well, Lord, we ask that in this moment you raise your hand of mercy of miracles, of marvels, that you, Lord, place your hand upon each brother and sister and each person that came today here in this place of Pachuca and all of those as well that are watching the video in the different locations around the world, that it may you resting your hand upon each one blessing, delivering, and cleansing, healing every illness physically and spiritually, removing, O oh Lord, every stain, curse, and spell, removing every witchcraft from the devil. Lord, as well, asking that you grant the petitions from their hearts, if it is convenient or not, that you, Lord, fulfill the wants from their heart. O oh Lord, hear the prayer. Hear the prayer, O oh Lord. Hear the pleas. And thank you, Father. Thank you, eternal Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you in the glorious name of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, for he is the honor, the glory, and the worship. Blessed forevermore, Lord. Blessed forevermore. Blessed is the Lord. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Glory be to the Lord. Grande es Jehová, y muy digno de ser alabado. to the Lord. Thanks be to the Lord in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And to you, thank you. May God bless you greatly. Thank you, brothers and sisters. May God bless you. A great blessing for you all.